the Red Chair. Today we have here Marcel Lebre, thanks, co-founder of Remote, uh, one of the Portuguese unicorns in our in our portfolio. Welcome, Marcelo. Great to have you here. Very happy shareholders. And uh, let's start by tell us who you are. Thanks, Stefan. Uh, great to be here. I'm Marcel. Um, I'm I'm an engineer by trade. Um, been a CTO for a few years, and I, uh, better part of the last three and a half years, I, I co-founded um, Remote, um, a company that helps companies uh, hire across the world and employ people across the world. And I, be, I started as CTO and co-founder and then took over all the ops world. So today I run about 75% of the company, uh, which reports to me. And uh, I run everything ops, engineering, uh, and a bit of product as well. It's a big company and we'll get to that. But how did you come up with the idea, right? Let's say this was three and a half years before the pandemic, right? So yeah. there were no, I mean, there were people remote, but not yeah. as much as the pandemic. You hit a huge jackpot. Uh, how did you come up with this uh, idea? Yeah, you know, I've, it was a bit of a serendipitous moment, I, I have to say. Um, we've been, you know, I was CTO and VP of engineering, leading engineering teams, mostly in Portugal. Um, and for, you know, I met my co-founder 12 years ago. And we always, you know, kept in touch. And we were both in tech and always tried to, you know, get up on, on projects. And job is Dutch, right? Yeah, yeah he's Dutch. Was he living here? Yeah, his his wife was Portuguese, right? And and we met because of our wives at the time and girlfriends, and we became really good friends. And across the years, we always talked about you know all things tech. He was at GitLab, you know, VP product, and we always very much in the same space. And we started talking about like the problems they had at GitLab. GitLab was a company that was founded like almost ten years ago, fully distributed, and they always had this massive pain of hiring across the globe. Everyone was a contractor. Um, they had to have massive teams, departments, just to handle that. And it was a pain in, in the butt because you had, you know, all of a sudden anyone can just quit tomorrow. And if they're a contractor, there are no big obligations. Also, people don't have all the benefits. You don't have the social credit of going to the bank and saying, hey, here's my working contract, give me a exactly. mortgage, you know? And it was such a big problem that it was something that was affecting you quite a lot. He would complain because he was managing product, a big, uh, big team as well. And on my end, I was suffering roughly from the same from the past 10 years building teams in Portugal because I needed the best talent. But we have great talent in Portugal, but the world is bigger. Right? So in order for you to scale a company fast, it's easy to find across the world. It's very hard to convince them to move into Portugal. And we started noodling on, on this idea of, okay, so if it's such a big problem, why isn't anyone doing anything about it? Uh, there are a few companies, you know, helping to hire locally and, and, and employ locally, but that doesn't solve the problem because then you have to manage 195 companies uh, interactions with EOR companies across the world. And then in, in 2019, we, we decided to take the leap and start remote. Um, right at the beginning, more or less, 2019. Yeah, uh, January, uh, January 2019. You, you so started a year... when Indico <laughs> launched its first fund. Yeah. So you, we're, we're the same age, kind yes. of thing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so, and so, how did that go? So you left uh, the company, which is also a portfolio company yeah, yeah. of ours. Yeah, yeah. And then you got together with Job. And what were the first steps? Yeah, it was very funny. You know, at the time we started having this discussion about. I think you know we amassed enough information and know how we built enough companies and help build enough companies so we own you know we know enough about the, the system and the space and roughly in december 2018 we said okay are we going to put our money where our mouth is because we you know uh, we talked plenty about it and and then we said well yes i think it's time to do it um we we and then we both of us left our jobs i was at embevel you was at gitlab um, and we, we, in January, 2019, we started this, uh, we, it was kind of interesting. We, we acquired the domain remote.com mm -hmm. uh, at the time, a, almost a year. And how much did it cost you to buy remote.com? Uh, you my remember? kidney, uh, <laughs> a bit more actually. It was, it was kind of serendipitous as well. Um, because, you know, we met the previous owners of remote.com. They were, you know, they were doing other things in space. Um, great entrepreneurs as well, and we you know we ended up negotiating 
how much, but it was more than more than a few precedes that I've, I've seen. Uh, but at the time, it was you know more so than an amazing more than, name, right? It was you know it was the name. Was and the I name. guess there's uh, it, it it speaks for itself. And so you you hire the first people. You, what is it, your first round of funding? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So we start. You know, we're, we're always very frugal, and you know, we're, we've always been anxiety-driven people. You know, anxiety is either a super problem or a superpower. We decided to turn it into super pro- power, and we're always very fast. The first thing we did, for those that remember, was we built a job board at the time. Like in three months, we we built it together, um, and because we wanted to start, like our business is a slow development one. Right, we have to open a country every time. And that takes months um, and it's slow progress. So we wanted to, you know, get a continuation on remote, um, what it was, the domain, capture some attention and, and, and highlights. And initially we were even considering do it, you know, on our own uh, budget, right? Whatever we could sell from, but, you know, our anxiety took the best of us and it was just too slow. Like it would take us, you know, six months to get enough money just to, you know, open a couple of countries. And it was just too slow. So we, at the time, we, you know, we we actually were not having any conversations about run uh, fundraising, but we were approached initially by a couple of investors, and you know, we, you know, it just made a lot of sense that we could speed all the all those years rather than waiting uh, for it to happen. And then we raised, I believe, the first pre-seed. It was like two million, I believe. Um, that we 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 raised. Short after, um, I think we closed our round, first round of all, um, roughly around maybe April, maybe uh, May, something along those lines, um, and that was it. It was the first, uh, uh, and we were four because we started only the two of us, and then a couple of months later we hired two people, two engineers to join us as well, um, and that that was the beginning, and then it, from that point on, the moment we announced what we were building, it was if from a sales perspective, we thought, well, we have some time to build this momentum. We had no time whatsoever. We had two to three months of backlog sales meetings up until the end of 2019, um, because it didn't matter how many people we hire for sales, the 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 demand for even before we had the first com- uh, country open was way more than we could offer uh, in, in service. And this was before the pandemic, yeah. right? Yeah. So, and then with the pandemic, it was like an explosion, yeah. right? And so in essence, what is remote right now? So what do you do for the companies, for your clients? Yeah. And how big are you in terms of, you know, number of people yeah. and, and countries um, and so on? So remote helps companies hire across the world and people get hired across the world. Um, and not not in a matchmaking situation, not, not a job board, but essentially a, a global employment solution. Like you have a company in the US, you want to hire Jane in Portugal, you come to us and you don't have an entity in Portugal and say, oh, hey, remote, found Jane, I want to hire uh, her in uh, Portugal. Um, here's the salary we discussed, make it happen. So we, we hire the person locally with all the benefits, health insurance, um, all securities, and with a local um, um, uh, job contract, and that's it. Uh, for companies, it's super useful because, you, you know, you just pay a, a bill at the end of the month and you hire across the world for the same budget. What do you do is you hire the best person in the world rather than, OK, I have, I don't know, 100K, going to have to hire the best person in, in I don't know, Chicago uh, for this budget. But now you have 100K to spare to spend in the world, getting all the talents. And so opportunities are not everywhere, but talent is. So you reverse this. And you make it um, uh, you make it ubiquitous. So that's what we do, uh, and we've been ever since helping companies. Right now, we're about seventy countries um, across the world. You know, the, you know, by principle, we want to be uh, in, in, in the entire world. Exactly. Um, we we started with the, the ones that had the most demand, of course, and then it poses itself as a bit of a long tail. But we 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 follow uh, we 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 follow the need as well and the principle. Um, we, we employ, I usually don't divulge the numbers, but dozens of thousands of people, uh, yeah. through us. And in the same way, we have companies that start with us, you know, with just the founder. Um, and now there are like hundreds of people. Um, and that's, that's awesome to see that you can, 
unlock companies and we have helped a lot of companies with COVID, with around the pandemic to uh, turn their business from local only to either hybrid approach or remote um, friendly and expanding across the world as well. And in the meanwhile, you've raised hundreds of millions of, of yeah. dollars. Uh, yeah. We have amazing investors in addition to ourselves. Absolutely. Uh, really well-known, famous Silicon Valley uh, investors. And so now, you know, you had this huge jackpot also with COVID. You know, we were in a way one of the benefited uh, industries of, of COVID. And now suddenly we have a crisis. How, how are you looking at that? What are the changes in in, in your clients, in, in your own sort of vision about how, how things should be managed from now on? Yeah, you know, a few things happened. Um, it wasn't just one, of course, every market, uh, every bear market is always, it, it happens because multiple things happen at the same time and it creates the perfect storm. And then you have an average like 20, 28 months of this. Um, but of course, one of the big functions of it was a war um, that is still raging. And like, of course, for remote, because we're at the heart of all these companies, it's like you're at the eye of the storm. You see it all starting to happen. You see it all unfolding as well. But at the same time, it helps us help companies and people, right? Um, with, with Ukraine was one of the things, uh, one of the, those initiatives where, you know, we were well suited to help people that were either there and needed help to relocate to other countries um, or, or, or just to know, or for companies that hire people there to know what to do. Uh, we continue to expand upon that knowledge because we're, given that we're all over the world, we fundamentally have to have it. And then we have to address the fact that the market is not necessarily crashing, but it's assuming a form that is more sustainable than the previous one, right? What we saw from many indicators is that the market, you know, Splunged on a lot of different ways, and you know you could see from the investment multipliers and the things that companies were able to raise, the conditions and the speed, um, it was and too often much. it was just too much, right? It was very clearly something that created like a, a positive spiral, but ended up in a negative spiral, right? Because a lot of companies could not sustain themselves, were raising on uh, a, a, an unfounded promise. And all of these things, you know, create a, a scenario where, okay, well, the market has to re redempt itself. What we see is that companies are becoming more aware of what it is to exist within this market, what it is that is actually needed to properly fundraise. And fundraise is not as a, you know, always been sort of against this idea of playing or this game of fundraising because it's not money isn't free and the mm -hmm. fact that you know uh funds like yourself and companies like yourself you, you 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 bet and invest in businesses and it's not a casino right, right. It's, and you uh, represent and people's money right yeah. absolutely like you you have you have bosses right have bosses. um that uh, that also earn their money right and so we had i believe personally that a lot of people did not look into this like, all right, so out of a thousand ideas, one will make me rich. And if not, I'll just fail and go about my business. And that's not life, right? right. You, you have to uh, work and you have to put your back into it and really make, build a business, not just that concept of, uh, uh, you know, uh, fairy tale, uh, fairy tale of yeah. a, a, a startup. It needs to be accountability, right? right? Exactly. Yeah. And so I think the world is now uh, seeking accountability and businesses that are truly businesses and that have demand for it and that are founded on solid principles. And this is what we're seeing, you know, uh, a fast maturing of the companies that uh, uh, that didn't. And, and the ones that did are, are, are doing OK and will continue to do OK. And so we see a lot of news out there of companies readjusting and um, that's good management. Um, I understand that there's a lot of people, you know, going out and that uh, it's it's tough on the market as well and on the people. Of course. Um, but it is it is a readjustment of the market itself. And new what we also see is that a lot of new companies are, are, are beginning as well. You know, starting with a different perspective of the market, of what it takes to create a business. And that's very, very positive. Uh, indeed. Yeah. When you look back now at the journey, it hasn't been that long. Like it's like our journey, not yeah. that long. 
at Indico at least. Um, would you have done anything different? What are the big lessons that you, you could sort of share with other entrepreneurs? Um, the only thing, uh, I, I tend to not dwell a lot in the past. I try to learn what I can and move, move forward. Um, as I said, as more of an anxious person, so anxiety comes from the future, not necessarily the, the past. But a few lessons come, come to mind, right? You, uh, execution is, is, is king. It's not about what you talk to others not going to parties, it's not, you know, we always follow, follow that principle. And so it worked out very well for us. You know, we never traveled uh, since we started our company. Um, I think uh, we, you're one of the investors, one of the very few investors that I, I know personally. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know, like uh, out of our board members, I don't know like 70% of them uh, personally. <laughs> uh, and I think it's focus, it's, it's very important and understanding that what you have to do is build a business, right? And one of, the, this is like more on the, you know, motivation part. One of the more, you know, realization things is that given enough time, everyone fails, even founders. And so the, the one thing that served us the best at Remote was the fact that we never brought our ego to the company ever. If we're wrong, we're wrong. If we don't know, we don't know. And that means that you have to run faster to try to either fix your flaws or help or hire or even replace yourself with someone that knows better than you uh, to do something. Uh, we've been always at every step of the, the, the journey assessing if both my co-founder and I, were we the right people to lead what we were leading? Mm -hmm. Now, given all the variables, we were, but this is, this can be not true for forever, right? right? Given enough time, as I said, everyone fails. And it's very important to be pragmatic about what the company is delivering, what you yourself uh, are can bringing, can, what are you bringing mm -hmm. on a day-to-day -day basis to the company? Did you, a lot of the very successful, uh, you know, companies and tech companies, normally one thing in, they have in common is that they hired very senior people very quickly to sort of beef up and so there's not a lot of time to sort of learn on the job, right? Did you do that as well? Yes. The one thing we did was, you know, it's very easy for you to think about like the first people you hire or the people you work with in the past or those people that have, you know, someone knows them. And of course, it's, it's helpful to have a network. But what you have to do is hire absolutely the best person that can lead that and always hire people that know more than you. Like, there's no point. I'm, I'm a COO. I'm an engineer. Um, I couldn't possibly know more from customer experience than you know the person I work with on a day-to-day -day basis. Right? Uh, our lead of VP of CX is, is one of the best uh, in the field. He's just amazing. And I could never assume to bring in someone that I could coach into the job. There's simply one, not enough time. And second, it would not be a good investment because I would I have my own cap. Um, I'm a pragmatic person. I'm, I like to optimize. I'm an engineer, but that's as much as it goes because then you need experience. You need to know how things uh, turn. Otherwise, it will take you just way too much time. You'll fail massively. You'll fail everyone in the company and yourself in the end. Now, this point you put, you know, you, you brought up about ego and about not focusing on parties, but actually getting things done is a really, really important one. Is there anything else? That you think, you know, when you have a big organization, right? Yeah. You or yourselves are about a thousand people. So yeah. it's um, how do you how do you become, um, you know, from a founder to becoming really a, a CEO or COO of a company with so many people? Because you have to devote a lot of time to actually managing what is no longer a startup. It's actually yeah. a corporate, right? Yep. It's actually a big company, fairly big company. Yeah. Well, a lot of the things were almost preemptively scaling, I would say. Uh, we It helped that, you know, my experiences were, were, were with companies up until 200 people. My co-founder had an experience of almost 1,000 people. So we knew, we, we knew a few things that needed to happen. You know, and then there's a barrier, I would say, that you need. It's like an escape velocity that you need to achieve. Like you know that you need to have a few, a few things in place. So if you have nothing, you just build whatever. It doesn't matter for the first year or so, the only thing we focused on was to really build a good culture 
in terms of what we wanted the company to be like. Um, we we're both parents. We wanted to build a company that could, you know, unlock a better world for our kids. And ultimately, we wanted to work with good people. So we made that into our own company values. And if someone didn't align, sorry, you don't fit, you go. I, that was uh, very simple to us. And then a few things we knew, like from a security standpoint, privacy, you know, legal, operational, we were putting the right people in place uh, across the different verticals and, and departments. And that was the only thing we did. And then what you have to do is like building a house, you create the right foundation and then you let it flourish. Like you have to right, hire the right people, as you said, the right seniority and the right tools, and then they'll build whatever they need to build. And the, the, the structure and the scaffolding will unfold itself. Um, we reached a thousand people very fast in less than three years. Um, the culture, uh, we, we run our own uh, internal census to see how people are doing. So far, very good. Um, I'm very happy with the results we've, we continue to get. But because we always stay true to our core tenets of the way we work. Um, but we're always relentless and we ask people to be relentless about it. And that helped. Um, going forward, we've seen that after like 600, 700 people, it's more about, more about maintaining this continuous development of processes, tools, you know, people, uh, culture, uh, but so far so good. What is your, what is your big vision? I mean, wh where do you see remote in sort of five years, if you can share that? Wow, I wish I knew. Uh, but it, what I can say is we, we so for one, we want to uh, cover the whole globe. And we want, it, we want it to be like sort of an engine for companies to start, start, right? When we started remote, it was really hard. There was no remote for us, right? And so it was really hard to, you had, we had to deal with lawyers, you know, operational people, companies that we have to outsource and to hire so that we could start our own things. And, 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 and that was really tough. We spent a lot of time just to kick off a company and then have to deal with payroll, health insurance and the people's uh, needs on a day-to-day -day basis. And so we went through that and we want to make sure other companies don't have to, right? So the same way, for instance, you have AWS that at the end of the month, your engineers just, you know, pay a bill and, and things are managed. Like if, if a machine crashes, you don't even hear about it. That's the kind of experience we want is that companies grow, don't have to worry about, you know, the, the payroll cycles, the benefits, the time offs, you know, if, if someone is paying a contractor or not, when is the next bill due? Um, you know, if you have to run either an off cycle to pay someone, how do you do that? You, have, you don't have to worry about it. The only thing you have to do is pay a bill at the end of the month. And, yeah, you know, your workforce is paid for and, and everyone is well taken care of with good benefits and you don't run into misclassification issues or a team in a certain country in an uprising because you don't treat them fairly. Um, that's the vision. That's the, the end game, you know, too. And on the other end, we've been very fortunate to be able to, you now less of company focus, but on people focus, help a lot of people across the world to find an opportunity that they would never get in their local countries. Uh, and we're very much used to this world of, you know, Europe, Western Europe and US, but we hire people in countries that um, some people don't even, can't even, don't even know where they stand in the map. Um, those people don't have access to the same technologies, the same opportunities, job opportunities, not even to get to talk with someone uh, in, in these uh, circles. So we brought it to them. And that, that is like, as, as a father, as a person, that to me is, it hits very deep uh, because you really, like even if the company were to go away tomorrow, like something happens, company closes, and we I know it fundamentally we helped so many people so far uh, that would never get that opportunity that it it would it is totally worth it. I'm sure people are very are very curious. Do you actually have an office, right? <laughs> at home. At home, right? Only at totally home. remote. We never had an office. Uh, we never planned to have an office. Uh, I think I think I may be mistaken because I believe there's one country that sort of forces you to have a physical space, 
but it's in a little room. You yeah. know, it's not even uh, no one actually sits there, but uh, it, it, it's a little room, uh, literally, but no one sits there. Um, and uh, no, we never had an office. Uh, everyone is across the world. Uh, I would say 95% of people I want, I never met them. Uh, we work daily together uh, and it's literally all over the world. It's pretty incredible. Well, I'm very grateful that you came here physically. Thank you. It was great to see you and I hope you enjoyed this uh, episode of The Red Chat. <laughs>